He's a, an internationally recognized historian, speaker, researcher, and author. He taught for 20 years at DePaul and Northwestern University in Chicago. He's made presentations for the last 30 years at museums, colleges, universities, conferences, professional associations, and community organizations. Dr. Gordon is a distinguished lecturer for the Organization of American Historians, and he has provided presentations here on various subjects closely related to World War II since, what, 15 years at this point? 20 years, like shorter than by five years. <laughs> to talk about commitment to what it is that we do here, and he supported the Air Museum's mission as well. He is the co-author of 21 books in the field of history, business, and education. His latest book, of which we have with us today, is uh, divided on the day how the conflicts and rivalries jeopardized the Allied victory at Normandy. He was kind enough to even guide a tour for us to Normandy not too long ago. Hopefully, we'll get to do one of those again. Um, here today to talk to us about judgment at Nuremberg, defending humanity. Please welcome Dr. Edward Rose. Thank you. This is the 25th anniversary of this museum. Of all the museums I toured throughout the United States, Canada, and overseas, this I consider my home base. I have done more programs here than any other museums. And I thank you all for coming here today. Judgment in Nuremberg, Defending Humanity. This is a crucial story, the story after the victory, of why the Allies fought and defeated. Nazism in Europe and the Japanese tyranny in Asia. Well, after the victory, the Nazis had been destroyed and now had come the time for rebuilding Europe, but also for justice. Here is Jodl signing the Articles of Surrender on May 7th in Rennes in France. I had the opportunity to be in that museum, it still exists. And then a day later, the Soviets insisted that Kyle had to surrender again in Berlin. There's Eisenhower after the German surrender with his staff, the pens of, of the surrender document. But now, what was going to happen to the Nazis? The millions of Germans who had been members of the Nazi party, the SS, in the various branches of the Wehrmacht. There is the Nazi empire at its height. And now, the thousand year life was now a crumbled room. That's a British soldier looking at a fallen eagle in the Chancellery of Berlin in 1945. Europe was, had been totally destroyed. Millions were homeless, millions of others were displaced. Six million slave laborers in Germany. Europe's economy was bankrupt. And now, the idea of purging the Nazis and starting a re-education program for the German people, who had gone through 12 years of intensive propagandizing by Goebbels. That was my subject last month. I think many of you were there for that program, and it was very effective. Because the masses of Germany had been convinced and many of them were still convinced that Germany had fought a defensive war, that the Aryan race was superior, that the Jews were criminals, and there was a world conspiracy, and now that the Allies would destroy Germany. At the center, of course, of that web was Adolf Hitler. What justice could be done to Adolf Hitler at this point? He was dead, of course, but his minions were still alive. Here is Dominus and Speer being arrested. And a war crime trial was going to be held in Nuremberg, the first of the war crime trials itself. And why was Nuremberg chosen? Here's the Palace of Justice. How many, How many of you were, had been in Nuremberg? Raise your hands. All right. How many of you went to the Palace of Justice? All right. And the reason it was held there is it was still standing. Most of Nuremberg had been flattened, though the Allies put a tremendous amount of money into repairing. This is a courthouse. This is where the Nazi trials were held. And of course, Nuremberg was the home of the great Nazi rallies. 
from 1933 all the way until 1939. The tribunal of justice that would be held in this courtroom to try the ideology of the Third Reich. It proudly repudiated and struck down international and humanitarian ideals. It violently suppressed all political opposition across Europe. It gave government policy to reduce millions of people to subhuman status. States were enslaved and destroyed. People were starved, put in death camps, and massive imprisonments and executions. As Churchill said, quote, we fought a war in defense of the rights of the individual to establish and revive the stature of all people around the world. Well, let's set the stage. Here is the famous trial center in Munich, I'm, I'm sorry, in Nuremberg itself. Uh, the left of that picture sat the judges, Russian, British, American, French, in that order. Behind the judges were two or three interpreters to help with the communication between the judges. Immediately in front of the judges sat secretaries who kept the records and the evidence. In front of the secretary's table at the far end were the lawyer's lectern. You can see that. Let's see if I can point that out. Actually, yeah, it's right. Here we are. There's the lawyer's lectern. That's where the prosecution and defense would offer their evidence. Behind the lawyer's lectern were the tables where both the prosecution and defense sat. In front of the court reporters sat 22 defense lawyers. That's right here, the defense lawyers. And behind them were the 22 Nazis who had been chosen to be tried at the first trial. In the back of the courtroom, back here, were the translators. Back here, the, uh, the people uh, with different languages and sat the, the reporters. And there were cameras in the front and in the ceilings. And where you can't see, in front of here, where, where the audience sat. 52 prominent Nazis were listed by the Allies, from which 22 were chosen as representative of the policies and the criminal actions of the Third Reich. Here is the dock with the 22 defendants in it. Behind was a door through which they would enter and leave. A row of seven U.S. soldiers in white helmets. They were called snowdrops, believe it or not. In fact, I talked to a woman whose father had been one of the snowdrops. I believe it was uh, this person right here. It, the security was intense in the Nuremberg trial itself. What were the charges? Well, there were basically four counts. The first two, the charge of trial, were crimes against peace including the planning, preparation, and starting or waging of wars of aggression or a violation of international agreements. The second were war crimes, including the violations of customs of laws of war, of crimes against humanity, including murder, enslavement, or the deportation of civilians and the persecution on, on political, religious, and racial grounds. Although the legal justifications of the trial and the procedures were controversial at that time. The Nuremberg trials were regarded as a milestone in the establishment of a, of a permanent international court of justice, an important precedent for dealing with later instances of genocide and other crimes against humanity. The Allies had stayed their hand of vengeance and voluntarily submitted their captives, enemy leaders, to the judgment of law in an open international court. This is one of the most significant historical tributes that power has ever paid to reason and justice. Well, let's take an overview of the defendants. Now, folks, there are 22 people here. I cannot 
give you in-depth on 22. I will cover all of them quickly now, and then we'll talk about some of the more interesting and principal defendants. The first, of course, was good old Hermann Goring. He assumed the role of defense ringmaster. He was going to rally the others around him that were being tried. He was usually very attentive and expressive in his gestures throughout the trial. Second was Rudolf Hess. He acted confused and irrational at times. He was very inattentive. He suffered supposedly from cramps, and he appeared incapable of defending himself. Speer, an, a favorite, Hitler's architect. However, he had only entered the government in 1942, and then he became the Minister of Arms. Von Ribbentrop. Von Ribbentrop was a sham. He had been a wine merchant before the war, and his direction of foreign policy of the German Reich was basically nil, because Hitler determined that foreign policy. Stryker, a repellent Jew baiter. During the trial, uh, he oogled the lady court reporters in front of him. A very ugly man. All right, here we go. There's Stryker. Hans Frank, the governor general of Poland. He was responsible to the deportation and uh, working to death of thousands of people in Poland. And uh, he wore dark glasses through most of the trial. And as he said in one of his speeches, we must annihilate the Jews to maintain the structure of the Third Reich. Arthur Unklaw, he had helped Hitler arm and take over Austria. Uh, he was involved as the ge governor general of the Netherlands and the deportation of the Dutch Jews. And of course, uh, at the end of the war, the Dutch were starving to death. Rosenberg, the so-called Nazi philosopher, he wrote the myth of the 20th century. He advanced the concept of German Aryan superiority. Field Marshal Keitel, Chief of Staff. He sat straight-shouldered and very impassive throughout the trial. Jodl, who was Chief of Operations on the General Staff. More mobile and often scowling angrily throughout the trial. Admiral Reiter, he believed he had only done his duty and was guilty of nothing. Donitz wore dark glasses during the trial, and he was believed he was not capable or culpable of any wrongdoing. Nurith carried out the deportation of Jews from former Czechoslovakia. Sokol deported millions across Europe to work in slave labor, destructive slave labor, working to death or starved to death. Kirkenbachen, repellent, a brutish, scar-faced hulk of a man, used uh, to, uh, uh, I'm sorry, he used so-called protective custody to murder thousands in the uh, custody of the SS or the Gestapo. Frick, he devised the administrative framework of the Reich and the legal basis of murder. He helped to plan the war and he was involved in virtually all of the Nazi criminal policies. Surak, in the enrollment of the youth in the Nazi Hitler Youth Program, and the propagandizing of Nazi lies to children and adolescents throughout Germany. Funk helped the theft of Jewish property throughout Europe and used to support the Nazi war economy. Fritsch, a radio commentator working under Goebbels, he propagandized the regime in his radio broadcasts across Germany and Europe. Von Papen, he enabled Hitler to become chancellor in 1933. He acted as the ambassador to Turkey for the Third Reich during the war. Shocked, visibly angry man, tried to distance himself from all the other defendants. He had been the general government minister of finance. He had opposed Hitler, and Hitler imprisoned him in a concentration camp. 
No, they were going to say, well, these men were all brutes. They were stupid men. No, not true. They gave a IQ test to all of them, and the, there are the scores. And the psychologist concluded that all the defendants were intelligent enough to know better of what they did to the human race. Now, what about the Nazis that weren't there, that had escaped? Well, there's Martin Bormann, Hitler's secretary. Hess, once Hess flew to England, he became Hitler's secretary. He was a brutish, coarse person, sinister. He signed the Holocaust orders, not Hitler. He promoted the harsh treatment of POWs and uh, the lynching of allied airmen that were bombing Europe. Heinrich Himmler, the head of the SS, ran the concentration camps, the Gestapo, murdered millions of innocent people across Europe. He had committed suicide. Uh, I should have mentioned that Martin Bormann disappeared trying to escape from the bunker during the Battle of Berlin. Hess committed suicide. And of course, the monster at the center of the web, Adolf Hitler. Hitler died in his bunker with his mistress, committed suicide in the final days as the Russians closed in on the bunker itself. So now let's look behind the scenes of this trial. Here are the cells, the prison that was connected to the courthouse by a covered walkway. The prisoners were kept on the ground floor. Their cells had a table, a chair, bed, and a water closet. They were kept under constant surveillance by U.S. guards who, as you see in the picture, could peer through and watch the defendants at all times. The defendants had very limited rights. They could receive one letter per week. All packages were examined. The opportunities to talk with each other were limited to only at lunch. The defendants were required to respond to the questions from the prosecution. And at the same time, they did not have to work with their attorneys. Each one was assigned an attorney. Coal and food, though in short supply, was given to them as at, at the uh, same amount as the German population. Uh, Goring actually responded very well. He had been grossly overweight and addicted to drugs and the imprisonment helped sharpen his wits back to his old self. So now the curtain rises on the trial. November 20th, 1945, the Nuremberg trial begins. Great excitement and anticipation, almost a theatrical first night. That some of the spectators brought binoculars. The room retained its theatrical air. The curtains were drawn to exclude the uh, sunlight. Bright lights were throughout in order to film the entire trial. The judges in the United Kingdom, the United States, France, and the USSR. Sir Geoffrey Lawrence from the United Kingdom was the court president. Francis Brill was from the United States. The first session began, there was a brief statement by the president of the court uh, saying how unique this trial was in the history of jurisprudence and that they would discharge their duties without fear, favor, and accordance with the sacred principles of law and justice. And here are the trial lawyers, as I just mentioned. The defense attorney, the principal defense attorney, was Adder Kutzenberg. On the second day of the trial, after all the formalities, the chief American prosecutor, who was the Supreme Court Justice, Robert Jackson, opened with a statement. He briefly gave a history of the rise of Hitler to power. He described the state of prosecution of Jews and also gypsies, Slavs, Greeks, French, and all that opposed the Nazis. His argument of war crimes that they had been premeditated and systematically carried out by the Nazi government under the rule of bogus laws passed by a rubber stamp Reichstag. 
His speech was a superb introduction to the trial. The wrongs which we seek to condemn, he said, and punish, have been so calculated, so malignant, and so devastating that civilization cannot survive this being repeated. Germany, of course, attempted to justify all this, that they were at war and they had to fight for their life. And he said, These war this was beyond the necessity of conducting a war. These were crimes against all humanity. The tribunal's judgment alone cannot prevent war, he said, but their establishment of a procedure to try aggressors would not necessarily stop aggression, but judicial action always comes after the event. The United Nations must evolve political and, if necessary, military means at its disposal to ensure that any nation which starts a war and lost it, and that those who began a war would pay for it personally. Jackson accused the defendants of guilt for the regime's crimes, but he did not accuse the German people. He was passionate, he was persuasive. He drew attention that Hitler never declared war on any country he ever attacked except one, the United States of America. He did declare war on the US. And that all the agreements that, and treaties that Germany had signed were broken. Across Germany and occupied Europe, where opposition was encountered, hostages were taken and killed entire villages, people, cattle, buildings burnt to the ground. The Nazis systematically plundered illegal, and conducted illegal deportations. They seized money, industrial plants, art, treasure, food, as well as they could to guarantee the German people would live and everyone else would die. Those destined for destruction on the, were sent to concentration camps. Those unsuited were gassed and burned. Others were forced into destructive slave labor. So what was the proof of these crimes? The extensive documentation and quotation by the Nazi leaders themselves, over 100,000 documents were assessed and masked for the trial, as well as 100,000 feet of film and 25,000 still photos to document what the Nazis had done. When the defendants first appeared that first day in court, they had been dressed with care, but they appeared to be two rows of elderly, shallow men. But now, after this introduction, they were now given a new stature of wickedness because they had been in charge of the mass murder of 20 million human beings. Well, let's look at the Holocaust. Here are the principal dates you can read. This is the 12 year chronicle of the Nazi savage murder. The latest figures from the Holocaust Museum here in the United States documents that almost 20 million people died in non battle related murder as part of Germany's final solution. Here's how it breaks down. Across Europe, the German Jews are invented every means to destroy human life. Gas, shooting, starvation, lethal, heavy labor, hideous medical experiments, burying people alive, hanging, and decapitation. At the Nuremberg trial, a film was shown of what occurred at these concentration and death camps. Many of the defendants, of the Germans, were so shocked with the film, they couldn't look at it. Some of them, and many Germans, thought it was a, a clever propaganda movie and had been faked. The Germans directed tremendous resources away from their war effort to build and maintain a vast railway program to transport people to these camps. Hundreds of thousands of SS troops were used at these camps. The total cost in human lives lost or uh, uh, hurt to these self-destructive means by Germany is staggering. Rudolf Hoss, 
was the commandant of Auschwitz. He organized and supervised all of these death camp of this death camp, and he was uh, first and foremost he saw himself as a technician of death. At Nuremberg, he appeared as a witness, a defense witness, believe it or not. In court, he described in a flat, matter-of-fact voice the details of supreme, his, his supreme organizational achievements, the murder of two and a half million human beings. With a certain pride, he explained the planning and how it was possible to bring up to a hundred wagon loads of people a day to Auschwitz, inspect them, arrange them, put them to work, or immediately kill them. He said this was an organizational triumph. It had been made possible because he was conscientious, measured himself against the best in the business, and was always ready to learn new methodology. Here, if anyone was the fount of irrepressible human misery, here in this man was personified all the Nazi virtues of duty, hard work, obedience to the Fuhrer, and the worst of Nazi callousness and bestiality. Here was a human being who had unleashed horror on a massive scale beyond recognition. A shocked courtroom listened to him in silence. The Nazi defendants were silent too. The prosecution rested its case. Well now, let's see, let's take a look at these prisoners. First and foremost, we'll look at Hermann Goring, the first defendant to testify, he knew that his life, that this was the end. And he was deeply concerned about his historical image for posterity. On March 30, 13, 1946, Goring began his testimony two and a half days. Goring received general praise for his poise, skill, and candor among those for whom he was no favorite. That is, Goring of the old days, said Papin, one of the other defendants, when he was still reasonable. Donitz was surprised that Goring had shown so much sober self-control. In his testimony, he presented no real defense of his actions. Instead, he said that essentially the Treaty of Versailles had been unjust and that Germany had the right to overturn it. For those purposes, the ends justified the means. He had set up concentration camps in which political opponents of Nazism were incarcerated. And at the same time, he participated in the purge of Ernst Röhm, the head of the SA, who was murdered by Hitler. He participated in the execution and trial of persons whom Hitler distrusted. He authorized the financial penalties, the civic disabilities imposed on the Jews after Kristallnacht in 1938. And he joined in the carrying out of decisions to take the Sudetenland, Danzig, the Polish corridor. He willingly helped to prepare the offensive war against the rest of Europe. Goring painted a vivid picture of a fulfilled governmental conspiracy to prepare for and wage a great war across Europe. Goring also sought to justify his systematic looting of art throughout Europe. As he said, he wasn't going to sell all this art. He loved art. He was an art collector. He amassed over 1,300 paintings, 250 sculptures, 108 tapestries, 200 pieces of period furniture, 60 Persian and French rugs, 75 stained glass windows, and 175 miscellaneous cabinets. He was just an art lover. On the record of Gordon's testimony, the conclusion is inescapable. He voluntarily furnished the evidence more su sufficient to convict him on counts one and two. Here is Rudolf Hess, a strange tale. He had been Hitler's supporter. He went to jail with him in the 20s. Hitler dictated Mein Kampf to him. He became the deputy Fuhrer at the beginning of 1940. He was the secretary to the Fuhrer, but he began to lose power to others in the Nazi hierarchy. He was opposed to the invasion of Russia. He then took a plane and flew to England 
and proposed to the British a treaty where basically the British would allow the, the Germans to destroy Russia, and the, and, but Hitler would guarantee the British Empire. How generous of him, as he guaranteed Munich, all those things. At Nuremberg, he refused to testify. Actually, he was very confused and mentally distraught. Now, how much of this was real or imagined, we still really don't know. Albert Speer, Hitler's architect. Speer was a personal architect, built the new Reich Chancellor in Berlin, designed the Nuremberg Parade Grounds, and actually had redesigned Berlin for a huge new capital. Its Congress building would have a dome 18 times the size of St. Peter's in Rome and seat 100,000 people in this giant stadium. Never built, obviously. February 1942, Dr. Fritz Tott, who was in charge of all of the Ministry of Armament, died in a plane crash. Hitler was so impressed with Speer's organizational abilities that he promoted him. At that time, there were 2.6 million workers in 1942 in Germany factories. Under Speer, it raised to 14 million by 1944. Greatly increased output. But the abuse of slave labor in these factories was attributed to Speer. Speer did acknowledge the evidence of Hitler and his own responsibility for this, what he did. But he had said he had no authority over the recruitment of the slave labor, and he never changed his court plea to guilty. He attempted to assassinate Hitler in the bunker by using poison gas, which did not happen. He refused to implement Hitler's neuro decree, which would have systematically destroyed the bridges, the electrical facilities, the factories, the hospitals, the transportation systems of Germany. Because as Hitler said, all the good Germans have already died. The ones that are left aren't worth saving. They can go down with me. Well, Speer refused to carry out that decree. He later acknowledged in his biography, Spandau, that he had been seduced by power and the glory of, of Hitler and that he was responsible for what he did. Field Marshal William Keitel, Chief of Staff of the German Armed Forces. His, his colleagues in the Wehrmacht called him La Keitel, which means the lackey. Well, he was a lackey. He basically, he just carried out whatever Hitler ordered, he carried it out. His highest principle, magnificent military obedience, that was his number one principle. The vital detail that was lacking, soldiers are bound, are not, are too bound by international and moral law. I never knew about the POW camps, he said. I never knew about the execution of allied airmen. He had no power of command, he said. Only Hitler as supreme commander could give orders. I was only writing out his orders. The army overstepped its mark upon occasion out of military necessity to win the war. He could argue with Hitler, but Hitler was a military genius. In fact, when France fell in 1940, he said that Hitler was the greatest field commander of all time. Keitel's cross-examination, he did admit carrying out criminal orders but that he did not have any inner conviction of becoming a criminal. Since, after all, it was the head of the state who held all of the legislative power. Perhaps this may be considered a weakness, and I shall be accused of, of some guilt, but as far as I'm concerned as a soldier, loyalty is sacred to me, and I may be accused of having made mistakes, and also having shown weakness toward the Fuhrer and of Hitler, but never, never let it be said, I was cowardly, dishonorable, or faithless. 
These objections rise from the military conception of a chivalrous war. We are dealing here with the destruction of a communist ideology, he said. And therefore, I had to approve such measures and sanction them. Thus, Keitel did not merely sign the unlawful orders, but he put his rank, his authority, to drive unwilling subordinates into obedience. Keitel's apology, if you can call it that, did nothing to extenuate, let alone excuse, his miserable weakness. The conclusion of his testimony, the end justifies the means. He recognized no moral order. Pardon me for a minute. Yodel, Chief of Operations. Met Hitler September 1939. Relationship, very impersonal and frosty with Hitler. Closest military advisor to Adolf Hitler. Stated he was unaware of the politics and crimes of the regime. Yodel voluntarily handed over all his papers and Fuhrer orders he expected to be found innocent. Question, how could he have been so close to Hitler and remain innocent of military crimes? Well, he said, well, I, I, I had a blazing temper. Many times I argued with the Fuhrer. Uh, Hitler's headquarters, he said, was a cross between a monastery and a concentration camp. It was hell to work there. He had numerous sharp altercations with Hitler, and he said he came to hate Hitler. Hitler made the decision, Yodel put it, into military, and I put it into military form. Hitler, master of the uh, supreme, uh, and master of secrecy, I'm sorry, he concealed the concentration camps from Yodel, of the Jews, and Yodel and, and Keitel were obedient to military virtue. And this is the crux. They demonstrated what we call the leadership principle, Fuhrer Principit, that all authority invested in Hitler alone. This was sanctosinct. There was no conspiracy. Hitler alone had the total power. So for many German generals, it was ingrained. They considered the glory of the war as something greater than themselves. The German military had joined with Hitler to create the Third Reich. They planned and executed the war, the terror, the devastation, the deaths of civilians. This became more than war. It was crime. Not soldiering, but savagery. This was not an individual act of individual soldiers who had seen their best friend die and they would shoot a prisoner. This was the orchestrated policy of the government of the Third Reich. The leadership principle at Nuremberg was struck down. It had no legal validity period for any war. An invasion of personal moral responsibility is not allowable in the military. To then or now. Well, now, here's the big question. If Hitler had been captured, what would he have said? Well, first of all, for the annihilation of the Jews, he had no defense. You could say, well, he never signed an order. That's true. They looked through all the documents. They never found Hitler's signature on any order to kill anyone. However, in Mein Kampf and in innumerable speeches, he spoke about the annihilation of the Jews, the international Jewish conspiracy, the destruction of the Soviet Union, the need for Liberstrom, and the annihilation of the Slavs and all those people, the useless mouths, so that Germany, if there was a blockade, could feed itself irregardless or regardless of any allied blockade. This was fundamental to his policy. People have asked me, well, if Hitler had not persecuted the Jews, if he had not done this, Hitler was an evil maniac. The basis of his ideology attracted the criminal element of Germany into his government. There is no excuse for what he did. None.
How about provoking World War II? Well, Hitler, again, no one else had the authority to invade Poland. Just as Putin now may attempt to show that the Ukrainians were attacking Russia, he, of course, staged a fake attack by the Poles on Germany. So, Hitler had been in bad mental and physical health by the end of the war, this is true. He had been filled with barbiturates by Dr. Morell, and therefore he could have been found incompetent to stand trial. I do not think that would have held water. He would have been hanged with the rest of them. Well, what about Eva, his mistress? Well, Eva, of course, hardly anyone knew of her existence except a few people within Hitler's inner circle. She was not part of any of these orders, policy, etc. And I'm sure she would have not been tried. Here is the important conclusion to this trial. Hitler's dictatorship was the first dictatorship of a major industrial state in modern technology. A dictatorship which employed to perfection the instruments of technology to dominate its own people. By means of such instruments of technology, radio, public address, 80 million people were subjected to the will of one man. Telephone, teletype, the radio, all it made possible to transmit his orders to the highest, to the lowest orders and powers in Germany that were ruthlessly carried out. Thus, many offices and squadrons received their evil commands from, in this direct manner. The instrument of technology made it possible to maintain a close watch over all its citizens and to keep criminal operations shrouded in a high degree of secrecy. The lesson? The more technology the world becomes or offers, the more essential will be the demand for individual freedom and the self-awareness of individual human beings and a counterpoise to technology. Mark that well for yourselves today. Well, now the accused did have an opportunity to make one final last statement. Uh, but first, the judges, well first we'll talk about uh, briefly the last statements that they made. Before the end of the trial, the trial went on for 216 days to August 31st, 1946. The defendants were allowed to make a final statement. Goring denied everything. Uh, he basically condemned and uh, could not understand the claims that were being made. He did not bring the war. He did not bring it about. Uh, and uh, afterwards, when they went to lunch, von Papen, the uh, man who had brought Hitler to power, uh, went over and said to him, who in, in the could be reasonable, who caused all this destruction, if not for you? You have taken, you haven't taken any responsibility for anything. All you do is make bombastic speeches. It is disgraceful. Goring laughed at him. None of the other defendants did. Hess talked about how he had worked with Hitler all of his life and he thought that Hitler was the greatest son who my people have brought forth in this thousand year history, Adolf Hitler. And I'm happy to know that I've done my duty to my people as a duty to Germany and to National Socialism and as a loyal follower of the Fuhrer. Keitel? Keitel said, now at the end of the trial I want to present equally frankly and my confession. That is my guilt. I did not see that there, I now see that there is a limit even to a soldier's performance of his duty. That is my fate. He said he did not, under, he did not see the perniciousness and the terrible consequences of the war that arise and he hopes that because of this trial, there would be hope for a new future in the community of nations for the German people. Some of the uh, lawyers thought that was a very nice statement, uh, but the Nuremberg trial had at least caused Keitel to change his self-perceptions of what he had done. 
the governor general of Poland, Hans Franks, converted to Catholicism during the trial. And uh, his uh, statement was that the German people would never live down the horror they inflicted upon the rest of Europe. The judges on September 1st, the judges went to work. They did not start from scratch. Earlier on the 27th, the tribunal held its first formal meeting. There were 22 meetings between the judges. They delivered their final sentences on September 30th, 1946. There was much contention between the national groups. At the beginning of the trial, the Soviet judge basically suggested I'm sorry, this is earlier. At Yalta, Stalin had suggested that at the end of the war, that 50,000 members of the German general staff should be shot. In reality, a great deal of horse trading went on between the judges. And many times, the Soviets wanted to hang all of the defendants. I'll give you one session in which they were debating whether to hang Keitel and shoot Yodel. Shooting a military man was considered a more honorable way to be executed than hanging. The Russians and the French both wanted to hang them. Finally, the, the American agreed to hang both of them in conformity with the other capital sentences, so Yodel was hanged. The sentences were delivered on September 30th, 1946. Eleven were hanged, three were given life imprisonment, four received long sentences, and three were acquitted. Here is more detail on those individuals. All appeals were denied. On October the 12th, the defendants were allowed to meet with their families. October 16, 1946, the execution took place in the prison gymnasium. One person at a time was hung. The press was present, the bodies were cremated, and the ashes were emptied into a local river. What was the significance of these trials? Well, the Holocaust was revealed to the world. However, I must say, in many ways, it wasn't. In my professional opinion, it was not until the publishing of William L. Shire's book, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, in 1960, that the bulk of Americans really read about the criminal rise to Hitler of power, the orchestration of an illegal war, and then what the new order meant. Taking people's skin and making lampshades out of it, woman's hair for pillows, and on and on and on. The bestiality of the Nazi regime defies the imagination. It might only be matched by that of Joseph Stalin and Mao Zedong, who murdered even larger numbers of people than Adolf Hitler. The only difference was he did it within a short time period. It took them a little longer. There were subsequent trials that were held after the major trial under a uniform of uh, a code for the prosecution of war criminals. There were trials for medical personnel, German judges, trials over the hostages, corrupt the manufacturing, corrupt, uh, corrupt manufacturing, the various uh, ministries and the high command. There are two movies on the Nuremberg Trials. One was a made-for-TV movie. The other was a movie that starred Spencer Tracy, and that was the trial of the judges. Maybe you've seen one or both of those movies. If you haven't, I strongly suggest watch them. You can get them free on the internet. After all those trials were over, the German civil courts brought to trial 25,000 Nazis who were found guilty of crimes. About 1,700 were major offenders. Now, did some of these criminals escape? 
Yes, some did escape to Argentina. However, you must be aware that to the United States at Fort Hood, we bought 4,000 former Nazi prisoners. The most well-known is Werner von Braun, the man who put us on the moon. It was one giant step for rocket science for Werner von Braun. We also had people who worked on the atomic bomb. German Chancellor uh, uh, Angela Merkel in 2019 said that in a speech at Auschwitz, nothing can bring back the people who were murdered here. Nothing can reverse the unprecedented crimes committed here. These crimes are and will part, remain part of German history. And this history must be told over and over and over again. The rationale of following orders was put to death at Nuremberg. There has been an evolution in Germany of a sense of guilt. In 1946, most Germans still thought they had fought defensive wars and that these were show trials, like Stalin had. By 1950, there was a spread of silence. Now, in 2000, and I've seen this for myself, I've been to Germany, I've had German interns in business in Chicago, they don't even want Germany to participate in any military activity whatsoever, the young people of Germany. They are ashamed of what Germany did. The lessons of Nuremberg for contemporary American society is to become more aware and less swayed by the current media trends toward propaganda and marketing the big lie to sway public opinion from either political party or across the media in general. It takes individual time for you to read, read more widely and, and diversely to discover the truth behind the major social, economic, and moral issues of today. We need this attention today and tomorrow. Remember, the Founding Fathers said that the basis of our republic was an informed and educated citizenry. We were the first nation in the world to pass laws to tax everyone for public education so people could be educated and not illiterate so that we could put human thinking people in political office. Was Nuremberg a fair trial? Where war crimes and crimes against humanity have to varying degrees of success and consistently been punishing people throughout history either by court-martial or by the victors themselves. But this was different at Nuremberg, because there they made sure all the defendants had legal counsel, the right to confront and cross-examine their accusers, to have any adverse witnesses they could uh, cross-examine, the right to examine all the evidence against them and the right to introduce evidence of their own. They were allowed due process. Some defendants were indeed acquitted, some were sentenced to life, some were hung. Being in the docket in Nuremberg was not an automatic death sentence. It was no drumhead trial. In terms of international law, the Geneva Convention as we now know it was only introduced in 1949. So the rules of war governed mainly by the Hague Convention, which were very basic compared to what we have now. Due to this low level of international law, it is likely that Hitler could have been successfully prosecuted and hung. The Nuremberg International Military Tribunal was a success and it established precedent for punishing crimes against peace in the future. It implemented the criminality of those initiating aggressive war as an acceptable rule of international law. If Putin invades the Ukraine, he could be prosecuted. 
for starting and perpetrating an aggressive war against a sovereign nation that is Ukrainian, not Russian. On December 11, 1946, the UN General Assembly affirmed these principles of international law recognized by the Nuremberg Tribunal Charter and the judges at Nuremberg defending humanity. Today's international court at The Hague uses these procedures in prosecuting contemporary war criminals, whoever they may be. Thank you for your attention.